Hello, and welcome to this broadcast, sponsored by First Baptist Church Summit, where we are leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. We are excited about how God is moving in His church here at Summit, and we invite you to spend the next few minutes worshiping with us through the study of God's Word. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. Happy Valentine's Day. How many of you in here remember your honeymoon? You haven't been on one. Maybe you plan to go on one one day. Maybe you're married and you didn't go on one and you think, well, maybe we'll make it happen one day. Mine has been now going on 12 years. That's hard to believe uh, that the Lord has blessed me and it's been that long ago since we went on a honeymoon. And most people really, really enjoy their honeymoon. Most people, when they go on a honeymoon, it's one of the best weeks of their life. It's something that they've looked forward to. They really, really enjoy it. But some honeymoons are a disaster. In fact, there are probably some of you in here who may have a honeymoon disaster story that you'd like to tell. Thrifty Car Rental actually supports a contest every year, and you can submit your story at www.honeymoondisasters.com, and you can read about people whose honeymoons were not exactly picture perfect. I want to tell you about a couple of those this morning. Um, there's a couple by the name of Paul and Leah Lusk of Sugar City, Idaho, and on their way to the Nevada, they flipped their car into floodwaters. If that wasn't bad enough, when they emerged and survived, they found out that Paul had hit his head, and he couldn't remember the accident, he couldn't recognize his bride, and he couldn't even recall that he'd been married just the day before. Then there's the story of Chris and Doug Clovis of California. They honeymooned in Cancun, Mexico. I, I love this. They lounged by the pool, they ate terrific seafood buffets, and they went dancing. And back at the hotel, six foot three, 255 pound Doug playfully threw his bride onto the bed. But when he landed on her, he broke two bones in her right leg. <laughs> three hours, one plate, and eight screws later, Chris was left with an $11,000 hospital bill that he found out insurance wouldn't cover. But this is my favorite. I love this. May and, Kyle, May and Kyle of Richmond, Virginia were finalists in this contest. They were on a cruise ship during their honeymoon, and they were forced to listen to the comedian on their cruise ship joke about the Titanic. And then the couple awoke that night to the terrible sound of crunching metal and the captain's order to abandon ship. Their lifeboat made it to the shore of St. Martin, where the cruise line put them up, are you ready for this? At a nudist colony. <laughs> now that's a honeymoon right there. So maybe yours didn't go exactly as planned, but hopefully it was a little bit better than that. But I gotta tell you, most of the tragedies that I see in marriages don't come on the honeymoon. They come years down the road, and sometimes when we come to a morning like this, we can say, not only do those of us that are married, do we want to have the best marriages, but if you're preparing to be married, if you think you'll ever be married, if you have friends or family that are married, the importance for our church, for our culture, for our society, and for us individually of having healthy, productive, God-honoring marriages is so important. And there's not a better book of the Bible to give us practical advice for how to have wise marriages in a foolish world than the book of Proverbs. Take your Bibles and turn with me. We'll start this morning in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14 this morning as we begin to get, as we begin together this morning. Now, because there's so many issues related to marriage, I don't pretend in 30 minutes be able to cover every issue or every problem. 
So we're going to break this up, and I'm going to spend, uh, this is going to be a two-part series. This morning and tonight, it's Valentine's Day. Come back. Bring your spouse. Y'all come. You can go out to eat tonight after church. It'd be great. So y'all come. We're going to have a good time together this morning. We're going to have a great time together tonight. You come and be a part of this two-part series. So this morning, specifically, what I want to talk to you about is a problem that I see in even good marriages. Even those of you that would say, if pressed, I believe I have a healthy marriage. I believe I have a good marriage. I I think that the issue that we're going to talk about this morning is one that affects every single one of us, an issue that we could all, that we all could use to improve the quality, not only of our marriages, but of our relationships with people in general. And it has to do with the way we talk to each other. Our big idea this morning is simply that we need to start talking to each other with kindness and respect and see where that leads. You know, there's a whole lot of problems in marriages and some of them are very, very deep. Some of them go very far back. Some of them deal with a great degree of hurt. But when we get right down to it, the day-to-day operations of marriage, it has to do with how we speak, how we communicate, how we talk to each other, and the way in which we address each other. And Proverbs has a great deal to say about that. And I believe that if we follow some of the biblical principles we're going to see over the next few minutes, that in even days, maybe even even hours, some of you can begin to see an improvement in your marriage. Now, I want you to know this. Let's just use a sliding scale, okay? One to ten. Everybody likes a one to ten. Don't write this down and don't whisper it to your spouse if they're sitting beside you. But if you had to give your marriage a rank on a one to ten, where would you be? If you had to say, all right, this is where I really, really think we are. Men, I just set you up. I just set you up. You're an 11, baby. (laughs) But all of us, I think, no matter what the score, let's say that you're crazy enough to think you're a 9. All right? Let's just say that. Let's say you you think you're that great. That means there's still room for improvement. If you're a 4, there's room for improvement. Wherever you're at, God believes that we can be better than where we are. And so Proverbs 17, verse 4, I'm not going to ask you to stand this morning because we're going to do a little Bible hopping this morning. It's all going to be in Proverbs, though, so you're going to be just a few pages back and forth. We're going to be in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs talks topically about different subjects. So this morning, we're going to look at how it addresses the subject of marriage. In Proverbs 17, 4, it says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. How many of you fight? How many of you argue? How many of you fuss? I love Christian people. I love, especially when you preach on this at churches, because I will have somebody every single time. I'll have somebody walk up to me and say, we've been married 30 years, and in 30 years of marriage, we've never had a harsh word. (laughs) I'm preaching on lying next week. I am. (laughs) That's the ninth commandment. And you need to repent of your lying mouth because, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Either if you live with a human being, that doesn't mean you don't have a wonderful husband. He might be the absolute greatest guy in the world. It doesn't matter. It means that you don't have the most fantastic wife. But you put two human beings in a home together with all the issues and problems and emotions and thoughts and difficulties and finances and children and everything that comes with it, don't feel crazy that you have conflicts You are going to have conflicts. So the goal of what we're talking about here is not keeping from having problems. I don't know how to help you with that. If some preacher announces, I'm going to teach you how to keep from having marital problems, don't even go. That's a waste of your time. Because if you live in the world, you're going to have problems, and you're going to have issues, and you're going to have difficulties. So the better question is, how do we deal with them knowing that they're coming? The Bible says that starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. If we begin to start fights and pick fights and can't let things go, then it's the same thing as puncturing the dam to a lake and the water flowing out because once it starts, how many of you know you can't stop it? It's flowing and flowing and flowing. So what we're talking about specifically today is arguing, fussing, 
fighting, bickering, conflict, the words that we use in communication. There was a couple, and they were just enraged in a bitter argument. If you're not married, some of what I'm talking about, or you've never been married, some of what I'm talking about, you're going you're gonna to think, that's crazy. That Stuff like that doesn't happen. Y- yes, it does. Y- yes, it does. And this couple, they're enraged. They, at this point, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, they don't even know what the argument's about anymore. They don't even know what they started fighting about originally. It's just turned into something it was never meant to turn into. And so they're getting after it back and forth. And finally, the husband, you know, you know, guys, when you get some mad, your ears turn red. I mean, <sighs> he's just breathing hard. And finally, he just blurts out. He said, I can't figure out for the life of me why God made you so pretty and so dumb. And she looked back at him and she said, well, that's an easy one, buddy. He said, she made me so pretty so you would marry me, and he made me so dumb so I would marry you. (laughs) Can we be real this morning? I'm hoping so. I want us to have a good time this morning. But but let's just be real about something. As crazy as that sounds, how many of you would be embarrassed if you were tape recorded some of the arguments that you have inside your marriages and forced to sit at your kitchen table and play them back? How many of you would go, oh man? How many of you know that when it shoots out of your mouth that it's out of there? and you can't get it back, you'd give anything. How many of you wish there was a rewind button and you could just move, just, oh, why did I say that? Why? Arthur Schneider, in talking about couples and marriages, he says that some arguing occurs in every marriage. Usually those fights are about several different things, but, but many of them surround, uh, are surrounded by money or about sex or about children. But Snyder argues that in what he calls fighting families, everything becomes the subject of a struggle, and bickering becomes their way of life. It's just what we do. If, if you were in a fighting family, probably one of these seven or several of these seven suggestions for, or rules probably characterize your family. Number one, you look upon each comment as having an ulterior motive wonder what she meant by that. Number two, you rebut by criticism in return. You're always thinking of what is the next comeback? What's the next witty little snippet that I can come back with? Number three, you have a knack for recalling all past criticisms. You can remember every negative conversation that's ever been had. In fact, and and men, I'm going to talk to you in a little while, but ladies, genetically, I don't know how y'all got such great memories when it comes to stuff like that. Do you remember on January the 4th, 1982, we were sitting in line at the shopping mall and you said, and guys, I'm telling you, they're thinking, I don't remember this morning. I don't remember what happened this morning. And and, and we have a way of digging into the past sometimes. We recite a litany of sacrifices made for the other person. I've done this for you, and I've done that for you. We press on for control of the other, never relenting. If hard-pressed, men, you storm out. Women, you cry. And then the last rule Above all else, we are going to resume this squabble at the earliest possible convenience. Friends, people that live in fighting families, what we need to say is we're going to have to be proactive about breaking this. I've told you in just so many sermons, insanity is just keeping on doing something over and over again and going, you know what, I think it'll be different tomorrow. That's crazy. You've got to do something different if you want to get different results. So, Women, I want to start with you. Why? Ladies, go first. 
And because I'm a gentleman, I want to start with you. So I want to talk to you for just a little bit, but don't get too mad at me because I'm going to get to your husbands, all right? I'm going to get there. we got a little bit of time. But women, I've got some key verses for you. I want you to write these down. I want you to highlight them. I want you to take them, and on your vanity in your bathroom, maybe you could write out some of these verses, and you can tape them to your bathroom. Maybe over your RPM gauge in your vehicle, you could write them out and stick them there, that you could commit these to memory and and know that these are wise and useful nuggets given to you by the Lord your God. And I want to start with Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9. I made a commitment going on 15 years ago now that I would preach one day from this verse of Scripture. And I had never done it. But I'm honoring my commitment. And I want you to hear it today because men... I want you to know you may not be in a amener. If you are an amener, don't say amen when I read this verse. Just don't, don't do it t- today, okay? And certainly if you've never said amen before, don't say it when I read this verse, okay? But I want you to see this. I, I want you to see, and I'm going to read them in conjunction. They're in the same chapter, Proverbs 21.9 and Proverbs 21.19. It's important because it's repeated in the same chapter and, uh, and it's almost verbatim. Proverbs 21, 9. It is better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Proverbs 21, 19. It is better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. Solomon says to his son, you need to know that if you've got a woman who is all the time fighting and bickering and nagging and quarreling, that you would be better off in the desert or making your bed on the corner of your rooftop because it is going to make life unbearable. This is the old adage, if mama ain't happy, guess what? Ain't nobody happy. That's right. And he goes even further, he says in Proverbs 27, verses 15 and 16, a quarrelsome wife, watch this, 27, 15, and 16, a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. He's saying, if you live with an ornery woman, it's like Chinese water torture. Strap your head into the chair and drip, 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 drip. He says, but you can't do anything about it because if they've committed to be that way, it's like trying to grab the wind. It's like trying to control. It's like trying to grab hold of oil. It'll run through your fingers. There's nothing you can do. He goes as far to say in Proverbs eleven twenty two, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Basically, he's saying this. When it comes right down to it, women... I want to concede something to you. I want want you to know something. And this is from the heart of men in general. You have a huge, huge effect on us. Sometimes we don't always act like it. Sometimes it's tough exterior. Sometimes we act like it doesn't bother us. Sometimes we try to act like we're just sloughing it off or that we're tough or that we're not going to fight with you or whatever else it is. But you need to know that your demeanor, that the way that you approach conflict, that the way you approach conversation, that the way you approach your husband, that the way you act, that your mannerisms, that the way you use your eyes, that your vocal inflection, that the way that you argue or fuss or fight or dare I say it nag has a huge effect on the men in your life and I'm not telling you hear me out hear me out because I'm going to get to the men I'm not telling you that you are wrong I recognize I'm a big target so I'm not telling this many women they're wrong I'm not that crazy men but what I am telling you is is that making sure that everybody knows that you're right shouldn't be the goal all the time. 
Sometimes just take a step back, take a deep breath, and recognize, do I want my husband to think that he would rather live in a desert or on the corner of a roof than deal with me? I'm not saying your husbands think that. But they might. And even if they might, isn't that reason enough to say, you know what, I may not be the worst woman in the world, but there's probably some ways in which I can try to improve on this. I love the story. An old man is on his deathbed. He didn't have much longer to go, and he was laying in his bed, and all of a sudden, he smells from downstairs. He smells this smell. It, it's the smell of chocolate chip cookies baking in the oven, and they're starting to come up. He can take the smells coming up the stairs, and, and as he smells them, chocolate chip cookies are his favorite thing in the whole world. And so with the last bit of strength that he has left in his body, he pulls himself out of bed and he begins to go down the steps trying to get, he's bracing himself, using every bit of strength these guys to get to the kitchen. And by the time he makes it to the kitchen, the chocolate chip cookies are out of the oven and they're sitting on, on top of the stove and they're on a cooling pan. And the steam is just rising from them as they're, as they're cooling off. So he makes his way across the wall and he reaches over and he takes his hand and he just tasted it. He could taste it all the way down, the, the way that those chocolate chips just fresh melted would taste in his mouth. And he reaches over to grab the cookie, and just as his hand gets a couple of inches from the cookie pan, whack! He gets smoked, and his wife slaps his hand and says, what are you doing? And she say, he says, well, I wanted a cookie. And she said, you go lay down. Those are for your funeral. Don't wait till they're dead to do something nice for them. <laughs> Men, your turn. <laughs> Proverbs 12, 14 and 16. We're going to be in Proverbs 12, 14 and 16, and then we're going to flip over to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 12 and Proverbs 29. Proverbs 12, 14 and 16 through 16, men says, From the fruit of his lips a man is filled with good things, as surely as the work of his hands reward him. The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. A fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. Proverbs 29, 11. If you flip, flip over there, I want to read these. I want to read these together. We're going to be in 29.11 and 29.20. I want you to see these two. By the way, all of these are written by Solomon, and they are written to a son. They are written as an instructor, a man who has lived a long life, giving wisdom, sage advice to his son who is coming behind him. Proverbs 29.11. A fool, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Verse 20. Do you see a man who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Men, I don't know how many guys I've talked to who justify acting ignorant by simply saying, well, I just blow up. I just got a temper. Or what about this? How many of you have heard this? Well, I just speak my mind. That is so ignorant. You know the best thing that a lot of you men could do for your marriages? Quit talking. Not all the time. Just at certain times. I just need to get this off my chest. No, you probably need to keep it on your chest. And I just speak what's on my mind. Well, sometimes what's on your mind wasn't worth hearing. And sometimes in the haste of the argument. And by the way, men, I wish, it was just, I wish we could just kind of, I wish we had all the women over here and we could have like a partition and we could talk and then we could run over here and talk, talk a little bit. But let's get real for a minute, men. You really think you're going to win an argument with a woman? 
You really think that, 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 that that's going to work? And so we, we blow up and, and, and anger, and then we, we vent, and our temper explodes. And at some point, the Bible calls that, what that's the definition of a fool, that we're unable to restrain our tongue because we're unable to restrain our emotions. And so Solomon says there needs to be a time in which you look at how you respond and how you communicate and how you talk. Two buddies went home for dinner one night to one of their respective houses, and as they walk in the door, one of the men calls out to his wife and says, Hi, honey. And he asked her how her day went, told her he looked, she looked so pretty, helped her set things out on the table. They sat down. She served a beautiful, delicious dinner, and they ate. And then the, the man looked at his wife and told her how delicious the food was and how much he appreciated all of her hard work. And the other guy's just sitting there watching all this, just watching him. And he looks at him and he says, uh, hey, why are you so nice to your wife? What's the deal? What's the deal there? Why, why are you so nice to your wife? He said, well, because she deserves it and, and it makes our marriage happier. And he thought, hmm, maybe I'll try that. So he went home that night, and he walked in the door, and arriving home, he grabbed his wife, and he hugged her, and he said, you look gorgeous. And for good measure, he said, sweetheart, I just want you to know that I am the luckiest man in the entire world. And all of a sudden, she just falls out on the floor and begins crying. I mean, just weeping uncontrollably. So he steps back and he says, what, what in the world? What, 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 what's wrong? She said, oh, she said, Billy got in trouble at school and got spanking. I got home and the refrigerator had gone out. All the food spoiled. Now you've come home drunk. <laughs> How crazy would it be that if you acted kind and sweet to your wife that she might think you were drunk? Try it sober. Try it daily. Try it regularly. Don't let it surprise your wife when you tell her how much you appreciate her. Don't let it surprise your wife when you tell her how beautiful she is. Don't let it surprise her when you tell her how much you appreciate her. Use the words of your mouth to bring about goodness. I hear all the time from men, and I, I feel like men, I, we can talk, uh, because I am one, I can talk with you a little bit more straight up, because I can t promise you now, I'm just being honest, I don't understand women at all. I don't. I, 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 there's some chip missing, I think, from all men, not just me, but I think men in general. I, I don't, don't necessarily understand women. I, I don't know that I understand all men, but I may have a little bit, little bit better, little bit better insight. But I, I've talked to so many men that'll say in talking about their wives, they'll say things like this. They'll say, she just doesn't give me what I need. Or maybe you'll hear this phrase, well, she just doesn't make me happy or she's not what I want. So, you know, what I always ask, well, tell me, what what would it take? What would meet your needs? What would make you happy? It, what would she need to do, or what would a human being, whether it's her or another woman, what would they have to do to make you happy? And if you hear the list, as men begin talking about, well, you know, she just asks too much of me. She wants too much of me. She wants to talk all the time. She wants us to talk about our feelings all the time. She wants me to tell her where I am. She asks me about money and how I'm spending that. She doesn't necessarily like some of the things that I do. And she gives me all these suggestions. And, she, and they'll give you a litany of things. Most of the time, it's not about what they could do better. It's about what they're doing that they don't like. But what I've determined is that the reason a lot of men are unhappy is that they really don't want a woman or a wife at all. They need a goldfish. <laughs> I'm serious. Forget a woman, get a goldfish. And here's why. You get a goldfish, they are pretty Especially if you've seen those ones that have those big fan tails on the back of them. I mean, they are gorgeous. And you can get a little bowl, and you can put, like, rocks and stuff in the bottom and a little tree. 
And all you have to do is once a day, you walk by and throw fish food in there, and that's it. You can look at it. It's pretty. It doesn't talk back. It doesn't have any issues. It just looks pretty, and it sits there in the bowl and doesn't cause you any problems. I want you to know, men, if you want to have a woman, if you want to have a relationship, if you want to have a wife, if you want to have a life that's worth it, it's going to require some work, and, they, and a woman or anyone else who is engaged with you is going to want some things out of you. They're going to require some things out of you, and that's marriage. When people get into it thinking that all it's about is having their wants and their needs met, you are headed for disaster because just like in your relationship with the Lord, your relationship with your spouse is it's not all about you. It's not all about you. And that could go for women or men, obviously. This is for both. Proverbs 16, 24. Proverbs 16, 24. Sixteen twenty-four, and then one chapter over, I'm going to read 17, 28. 16, 24, and 17, 28. 16.24 says, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. They've studied couples that have remained happily married for years and tried to find common denominators. What, what are some of the common denominators? And it's not a lot of the things that most people would think. The number one common denominator that they found of couples that had stayed happily married for decades at a time was that they frequently, that they frequently spoke kind words to each other, that they said, I love you frequently, and that they vocalized both their appreciation and their admiration for each other. Now, that's so simple. How simple is that? That if you're married and you want a better marriage, you ought to talk to each other better. You ought to pay compliments. You ought to say thank you. You ought to say I love you. Some people say, well, they know that. But they know I love them. Tell them anyway. She knows I think she's pretty. Tell her anyway. He knows I appreciate all he does for our family. Tell him anyway. Tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them. And when that begins to start, much of the nitpicking and having to have the last word will begin to stop. Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent. My mama told me when I was little, if I didn't have any ni anything nice to say, don't. I mean it. If that's all you did, if we just left here and that's all you did, said, you know what? In my marriage, if I don't have something nice to say to my spouse, I'm not going to say anything. And you practice that for two weeks. What do you think would change? I believe it would revolutionize things. I believe that. I believe it would revolutionize marriages if people just placed in what I call the three-second rule. That was three. That means that sometimes, before your alligator mouth overloads overload your hummingbird rear end, you should take three seconds and think about it before you speak. I can make some good decisions in three seconds, and I can go, ooh, probably not a good idea. In three seconds, I can say, Lord, help me. In three seconds, I might can say, Lord, help her. I, I can pray. I can take a step back, and I can say, you know what? This might not be the wisest way to approach this. Practicing positivity. My whole life, 
and hearing about marriage, I always heard that marriage is 50 50. That it's marriage is 50 50. You know what you're going to get if you got marriage is 50 50? Divorced. And here's why. Here's why. If marriage is 50 50, that means you've got each person only given a half effort. If you want to have a great marriage, it's got to be 100 100. Meaning both people giving 100%, doing the best that they can. You're not going to be perfect. So I want to give you one last little practical piece of advice before we go into a time of invitation. The always when this subject comes up, one of the temptations for everybody is to think, I hope he listened to that. I hope she got that. I hope she was taking notes. I hope she listened. I hope he got it. What I want you to do is, for just a moment, forget about anything that I said that your spouse needs to do. Forget it. Because you can't control them. How many of you have been married more than 10 minutes know that, that you can't control another human being? How many of you know that? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to forget about what they need to do, and I want you to think about what you need to do. What do you need to do to make it better? What do you need to do to make it more God-honoring? What do you need to do to be a better wife? What do you need to do to be a better husband? Specifically, in the way that we speak, in the way that we talk to each other, how can we be a people who honor the Lord by the way that we treat each other inside our marriages? In just a moment, we're going to pray. And as we pray, I want you to know that whether it's right where you are or whether it's at this altar, that you can come and simply pray for your marriage. You can pray for the marriages of this church. You can pray that God would bless you. You can pray that God would help you. You can pray for God's strength or by God's power or God's comfort. Maybe it is that you are married today and you are looking for a church home. You need a church. You need a church that will walk with you and love you and encourage you. And First Summit would love to be that church. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I can tell you whether it's in your marriage relationship or any other relationship, nothing will ever be made whole till you get right with Jesus. We sang it this morning. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. He's the one you need to seek. He's the one you need to go to. And if you find yourself in him, healing can begin to work in every other area and every other facet of your life. Stand with me. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to know more about First Baptist Summit, please visit our website at www.fbcsummit.org or call us at 601-276-2396. Of course, the best way to know more about us is to be our guest on Sunday. Here's our schedule. On Sunday mornings, worship and Sunday school for all ages starts at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And there's an evening worship service at 6. On Wednesday evenings, our fellowship meal begins at 5 p.m. And activities for all ages start at 6. Again, thanks for joining us today. You've been listening to the broadcast of the message portion of our services at First Baptist Summit, where we are leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known.